Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In this lecture, we will review some very basic facts about causality. Causality poses a dilemma for philosophers. It has been a perplexing issue for Hume, Kant, all of the major philosophers. And this confusion about causality persists to this day. There is no clarity about what causality means and how we can detect it. On the other hand, babies learn about causal effects almost as soon as they are born and they learn to use causal effects to control their environment. So the problem is, why is causality so easy to learn for babies and so hard for philosophers? So the goal of this lecture is instead of discussing philosophical theories and complexities, we will just study how children, how infants learn about causality. The empiricist philosophy says that causality cannot be observed. We can see that event B followed event A, but we cannot see that event A caused event B because causality has to do with the idea that if event A had not occurred, then event B would not have occurred. And this is something we cannot see. Uh, this is a problem for which has been discussed by all major philosophers. And the basic issue is that what is the, if how do we learn about causality given that it does not seem directly observable from the facts that we can observe. In a later lecture, we will study how we can define causality. What does it mean to say X causes Y? For the moment, we just note two major questions associated with making such a definition. Definition. When we say that X causes Y, what exactly is X? In the sense that, uh, suppose I say that I strike a ball and it hits another ball and then um, the second ball starts to move. So is it that particular event on that particular uh, table on, with those particular balls? Or does this generalize to all balls on all types of surfaces? So the question is that given a particular event, you can only say something about that event. So when you want to say about talk about causality, then you have to generalize. You have to say, what is this event A? Not the particular event, but a particular type of event, which if it happens again in the future, then the type of event B will also happen in the future. But this issue of types, how do we generalize from one specific special event to a whole class of events? This question is not, not well understood. And then there is the second question, which is also very important, that if we see event A being followed by B many times, this is just a correlation. How do we know that event A is actually the cause of event B? So these two questions arise when you want to study or define cause. So the answer to this is given in the Quran. Allah Ta'ala taught us the names of things, taught Adam alayhi salam the names of things, which means also that this knowledge was also transferred to the progeny. It's built into us. But what are the names? The names are basically the idea that the type of object is uh, known to us in advance. So uh, if we know that this is a table, there is a whole type. Now this type doesn't exist in the world. In the real world, we only have one table and another table. All tables are unique and distinct and different from each other. But the categorization that all of these things be belong to the same type, this is done by our minds. And the same type means that they have the same causal properties. This is of essential importance. So when we see some object being able to do something, then we can infer that similar objects will also be able to do similar things. So the causal properties of one object will be, uh, will be present in objects of the same type. And this similarity, this knowledge of similarity is essential for us to have any learning about the world. So when we observe something, then we learn something from this observation that can be applied to uh, understand what will happen in the future. If there was no similarity, if different objects would have different causal properties, then we would not be able to learn from our past experience what to expect in the future.
The second problem is how do we differentiate between correlation and causation? How do we know if when we see B happening after A, whether A caused B or whether uh, this was just an accident? So one simple answer is that sometimes we actually do the event A. We do something which is the event A and then we observe a response. So the change is caused by us and we experience the change. So an example of this is that from basically from birth, babies learn to suck at the nipples of their mothers to get milk. And they learn that if I suck, I will get milk and if I stop suck, sucking, I will, uh, the milk will stop. So my action is causing a response. So this causal relationship is learned by experience and this is very different from observation and this is one of the major source of uh, difficulties for philosophers that they think of observations of external reality and they do not think about the fact that we are participating in this experience and so we actually directly experience causality. A key difficulty for philosophers has been the issue of counterfactuals that if x happens then it causes y means that if x did not happen then y would not happen. That's called a counterfactual thinking about something which did not happen. Now according to philosophers we can never observe what would happen if X did not happen because X happened so uh, the other alternative is not observable. Now the problem is that uh, babies don't understand, uh, babies understand counterfactuals because they know that if I stopped sucking the milk would stop because of their experience and they know that if they are not sucking then, um, then that if I start sucking then the milk will start to flow. Uh, so again, so the counterfactuals that philosophers find so difficult come naturally to babies. If you look at philosophers' theories of counterfactuals, they are so complex that uh, uh, college-educated uh, students cannot understand what the philosophers are saying. So those theories are rather different from the babies' theories of counterfactuals. The fundamental problems that philosophers have with uh, causality comes from empiricism and this is the idea that knowledge comes from observing the world. But the, actually this is not true for babies. The knowledge that they learn about the world does not come from observing the world. It comes from interacting the, with the world. What they do is they try to manipulate the world and they try to take actions which bring about change. So their knowledge comes from how can I walk? How can I learn to talk? How can I learn to stand up and so on? So the knowledge that they derive is experiential knowledge. And this experiential knowledge is not part of observational knowledge. And since the philosophers' theories of knowledge are all about what we can observe and not about what we can experience, so they have great difficulty with causality because causality comes from experience and not from observation. One objection that can be made by this is to be made by philosophers to this is that babies have instincts, they don't have knowledge. But experiments show that this is not true. One experiment to ask if babies know the recognize the voices of their mothers was conducted ingeniously by uh, attaching uh, voice recordings to nipples. And when babies would suck on these nipples, they would produce the recordings and when they stopped sucking then the uh, recording would stop playing. So babies learnt uh, this mechanism after a little while and then they showed distinct preferences for recordings in their mother's voices to the same narration in someone else's voice. And, and uh, this preference was shown by their continuing to suck longer when the recording was that of the mother's. So this shows that the action, uh, that their, their suction produces effects, is transferred to a novel context, which is exactly what knowledge means. Whereas if it was an instinct, then the babies would not be able to transfer from sucking to get milk to sucking to listen to their uh, mother's voice.
So what do we learn from this experiment and many others like it? Basically, babies have knowledge of causal relationships from birth. They know that their sucking produces effects and as they acquire more capabilities, uh, they are uh, able to use their hands to grasp objects and they know that this is my doing. So my reaching out and grasping an object and pulling it towards me brings it towards me. So babies learn about causal relationships through personal experiences. They make choices, decisions, and take actions which have effect on external reality. This means that the decisions that they are making and the choices they are making are made by free will and they are not bound by Newton's law. It is not that some uh, initial conditions which were present at the Big Bang billions of years ago determined what the babies are going to do today. Now, the problem is that the philosophers uh, have bound themselves by certain uh, axioms of thought, certain habits of thought, which do not allow them to see this. So uh, the methodology of uh, accepting the idea that every particle in the universe is bound by physical laws prevents the philosophers from understanding what free will means. So basically, scientific methodology, as created by Ibn al Haysam, says that we should not impose our preconceived ideas on what we observe. Instead, take what we observe as the reality and adjust our theories. So we see that people make choices and that babies make choices and we experience free choice. So let that be the axiom that this is what we observe and create theories which match instead of changing the experience and the description of the experience to match our preconceived theories of determinism. We look through some simple examples to see how babies can learn about causality. Initially, babies experience some problems, some difficulty, some discomfort, and uh, they respond by crying. This happens naturally. They don't, uh, uh, th this is built in. And uh, the crying attracts attention of some adults, probably the mommy comes running to see what's wrong. And so the babies just are passive observers initially that some discomfort occurs, then crying occurs, which they experience. They experience that they are crying, but they don't voluntarily produce the crying. The crying is produced by the discomfort sort of automatically. And this leads to adult attention. So they watch this sequence of events happen to them. Just the sequencing does not establish causality. Uh, the fact that adult attention follows uh, crying does not mean that adult attention is caused by crying. There are two possible causal sequences. One is that the problem, the distress that they experience causes crying and also leads to adult attention at a later stage. In this case, crying and attention would be correlated, but crying is not the cause of the attention. But the other sequence is that uh, it is the crying which causes the attention. And so these two, these two causal paths diagrams are both possible and these are observationally equivalent. You cannot distinguish between these two on the basis of a sequence of observations. And this is the problem. How do we tell the difference between correlation and causation? But babies learn to use interventions to break the equivalence. And the baby wonders, what happens if I cry without cause? So in this case, the discomfort causing crying, uh, the link between the this causal sequence, the, between the problem to crying, is broken. And instead, it's an exogenous event which leads to crying. What is the exogenous event? My decision to see what happens if I cry. So now, if uh, I cry without uh, any cause, and that leads to attention, then I learned that it was not the, uh, the problem that led to attention, it was the crying which leads to the attention. On the other hand, if the other sequence is valid, if uh, it is the problem which leads to attention and not the crying, then uh, an exogenous intervention of crying will not lead to attention. So what this shows is that if we do an exogenous intervention, if we actually Yani impose, instead of observing the system, we actually go into the system and change things, then we can learn about causality. And this is the basic, the key 
to learning about causality. Interventions which are exogenous and which break existing chains allow us to learn about causality very quickly. Now there is a subtle difference in the two scenarios. A problem or distress induced crying is different from experimental crying. And so uh, it's possible that the two types of crying would uh, lead to different types of outcomes. And in fact, we can know that this happens because mothers learn to differentiate between infants crying from pain and infants just crying to attract attention. And uh, the rapidity which with mothers respond to the cry also depends on the quality of the cry and they can uh, 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 what's more interesting is that the infants also learn the that the response to the two types of crying is different. The infants learn that uh, if they, they issue a cry of pain, the mother comes quickly. And if they are just crying experimentally, the mother's attention might not be as strong. Infants are born with curiosity and they do all sorts of things to try to learn about the world. So once they learn that there is a difference in the quality of the attention that they receive, they can also make other types of interventions uh, to learn more. For example, infants, when they realize that the mother doesn't pay attention to them if they are crying experimentally without any cause for pain, they will go and hit their heads against the wall or do something else which is supposed to cause pain and then cry uh, so that uh, the mother pays them the same type of attention that they get when they experience a real problem. Another type of intervention is that instead of um, crying without cause, they fail to cry with cause. So sometimes they don't want attention. They are playing and they bump their heads or they experience pain which would normally lead to crying. But they know that if I cry, then the adults will come and will remove me from this game that I am playing. So they suppress their uh, natural instinct to cry. And so that's also another intervention in crying. Instead of the crying no longer responds to the pain. And instead, there is an exogenous suppression of crying in order to prevent uh, attention, which they do not desire. So these types of in interventions allow us to learn about causal sequences with great precision and with great efficiency. So we can wrap up this brief discussion by noting that babies live in an environment which is changing, their own capabilities are changing, the causal responses to what they can do are also changing. And so causal links need to be learned rapidly. They cannot afford to wait for seeing thousands of repetitions in order to create hypotheses about causality. And in fact, interventions provide a very powerful and very quick and efficient way of learning the cause. So when I flip a light switch and the light comes on, then I can deduce that the light came on because of my flipping the switch because no one knew uh, my, my flipping the switch is not caused by anything else. So since this is an exogenous event and it leads directly to turning on of the light, I can deduce with just one switch with one flip that uh, the light comes on because of the switch. Similarly, uh, the, there are many other events like this where direct exogenous interventions have effects and then you learn that it is the intervention and you learn to suspect. I mean, one of the things that is important about this causality is that uh, this is always a guess. There may be some other factors which are causing things which we don't know about. For example, the idea that when I flip a switch, God intervenes to cause the outcome. This is a standard Vazalian uh, uh, philosophy and, and this is may be true and we have no way of knowing that. So the exogenous interventions lead to outcomes gives us the causes for all the causes that we can see, but there may be unknown factors which intervene about which we cannot say. For example, the hidden wires inside the wall, they are part of the cause, but we don't know about them. 
So we can learn about what we can do that can cause outcomes without having a full understanding of the causal chains that allow us to make an impact on the world. So what happens, how it happens, and why it happens, these are three different questions. Uh, I can know that uh, crying will cause an adult to appear, but why this happens, uh, I may not know. So I can do something which causes something else to happen without having a good understanding of the mechanism by which this happens. I may have theories about this mechanism, and these theories may be wrong, but st uh, still the effect of using the theory may be right. So the causal mechanism here is partly disposition, dispositional. What is the attitude of my mother towards me, about which I have no idea as an infant. Another part of the causal mechanism is mechanical. Can my mother hear the sound that I make? Uh, what, at what distance is she? And so on. So basically, when I manipulate the world, I can successfully manipulate, I can cause my mother to appear, even though I don't have a, a good theory about what my mother feels or understands. Or, uh, and also, I may have a bad theory about mechanisms, about how sounds work and how sounds transmit through the atmosphere. But even with very bad theories uh, about uh, how people behave and bad theories about the mechanism, the physical mechanism which governed the world, I can be successful in manipulating the world. And so this is very important to understand that manipulations are primary. Doing things, making things happen can be done with the bad theories and with poor uh, knowledge of the environment.